Hi, what I wanted to do today is go over uh, the completion of the uh, boot, the Lumps boot, uh, this leather boot that we uh, initially created. So uh, I've tweaked it quite a bit since our last uh, demonstration that I did. I've added the metal on here. I've actually done some tweaking on the laces, and then I've added uh, a little bit of dirt down here on the um, on his uh, rubber sole. And uh, I've decided, you know, at the time of my last video, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go with a darker on my occlusion, but I decided to end up going lighter on it. So like, we've kind of got some rubbing and some dirt that's built up in there. And so I want to go over uh, how to do uh, this part, okay? All right, so um, I'm going to do a deconstruction. I've already built this, and so just show you how I built it. Uh, this is a little turnaround that I uh, rendered, so I can kind of evaluate it. Uh, what I normally do, you know, I don't do those ancient uh, animations that we used to do a long time ago where you would take something and do a turnaround and you would render it, you know, 120 frames or something animation. That's kind of old school. Nowadays, what we do is we just uh, render one of these little uh, scrubbable turnarounds, okay? And this is loaded in Max's RAM player. And I just, it's just 16 frames i rotated it 108 i mean 360 degrees so you can see all the angles and this allows somebody that wants to uh, view your model to be able to you know see it from different angles but not have to sit there and watch an animation so you can just sit there and scrub this and see it so it's got 16 uh different um positions so you can see it the light hitting it and how it shines how you know what your specular is going to look like with the bump and everything on it so um Let's go into this. Okay, so, um, you know, the model, um, we've already, you know, done the leather and everything. Uh, so I'm concentrating on doing the metal. Okay. So I just want to go in here and show you uh, my node that I'm using. Here is the actual um, metal node that I'm using. It's got a composite on it, just like what we were doing for the leather. So as a matter of fact, this is, this is done exactly the same way that we did the, um, the leather. Okay, but I'll kind of go in here and uh, deconstruct this for you so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay, so to create my initial material, uh, then I'm doing the typical thing that I tell you guys to do. I'm coming in here and I'm going to get uh, an arch and design material and drag it out. Uh, arch and des design has a bunch of templates in here. Okay, and for metal, I always start off with this uh, copper down here. And it's a really nice uh, setup for metal already preset for me. But it, though it does have um, some issues, if you really look close at this, you'll see some striations in here where you're seeing the actual edges of the um, polygons in there. Um, and the reason that is is because that when they created this, I'm not sure you know, why they created this, but down here on its anisotropy, uh, attributes. Uh, it allows you, uh, what it's got in here is allows you to map it to a channel instead of doing automatic which direction you want to go. So this allows you to, based on some uh, a mapping channel, direct which the direction it's going. And right now it's set to zero, which is a vertex uh, channel. So in other words, you know, it's it's reading the vertex channel to figure out which direction it wants to go. And for most of the time when I'm doing things, I don't really need that. Okay, so I'm going to go to automatic here. And as soon as I go automatic, you'll see it'll get rid of that. So that's uh, kind of an, you know, odd thing. But anyway, so that's where I initially start with my metal. Now, in my case here, then what I did was then I'm coming here and changing the color. And then I'm just going to go, I want more of a blue tint on this one. Okay, so I want a little bit more blue. And then I want my saturation to be pretty low. So in other words, I don't want it to really seem blue. It's just got a, a tint of blue into it. So you don't want much saturation at all. And that's kind of how I started with my, um, the color of the metal, okay? Okay, so, uh, of course, then I applied that to, to the uh, metal parts on the boot. Now, this is uh, what's nice about uh, approaching it this way is I'm going to do the same thing that I did on the other one in which I'm going to create a, a composite node, which is our layers like we, like we talked about. And I went ahead and once I made the metal, I just went ahead and copied its color and then I put it in a color correction node. 
Um, a color correction node is just a node for generating or altering color. And so then I was able to paste it into its default color here. And so basically I'm just running that through. And so it's just giving me my color back right to where I was. Okay. So it's kind of like if you were in Photoshop, you're filling your base layer with a solid color and then we're going to build on top of that. Okay. All right, so then I add another layer and I've got several of these layers turned off and we'll go through those, okay? The next layer I did, and this is what's nice about this, is I use the same um, bitmap that I used on the leather, okay? So I'm using the same bitmap that we use to stain the leather. Now what's nice about this is how long something takes to render is directly related to many aspects but one of them is how much how many uh, bitmaps we have loaded into ram and so what i'm able to do is use the same bitmap to get my uh, staining on this and it's not costing me anything in uh resources because it's already loaded because it's what i was used on the leather okay now yeah, i could use other ones in here but it's just according to the look but i was able to get the look that i wanted with that one and so it was great because it doesn't cost me uh, any resources I ended up uh, putting that on top of this uh, blue with a multiply at 10. I don't want to see it uh, too much, okay? And uh, you'll see it here. Now, this has got the bump on it, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the bump off for a second where you can see the shader without the bump. So I'm going to turn the bump off. So there's the shader, and you'll see it's kind of got a model look on it, okay? The other thing is then... Also, what I'm doing is I'm just copying those mapping coordinates. Okay, here's my stain. So I just copied the same thing. I copied the mapping coordinate off of the leather and then just pasted it on over here. Okay, and that allowed me to automatically have it uh, where I was close to what I wanted. Then I was able to just turn on. Uh, so we can see that in our viewport. And I turned it on to our blue metal. And that way when I'm moving uh, that gizmo, then I can see how I'm placing uh, that on our texture. Okay, so how it's going to be applied on there. So that's the same thing we do with the leather. So that's nice. I already had it set up perfectly because it's aligned. I did a bitmap fit. So all I had to do is copy it and put it on there. Okay. And then just adjust where I wanted to place it. Now, the other thing I did is um, when I'm staining the metal is it has some uh, rivets in here. Okay. So what I would wanted the rivets to be a different color. So what I did was I'd already made um, a rivet color for the eyelets that's on the boot in these areas in the leather. So I just used that same material again and placed it back onto these little rivets. And those rivets are in several places on the metal. They're in these corners. And if we go around to the uh, back, you know, in here. So that allowed me to uh, fluctuate it. I mean, you, what you want is subtle differences and changes. And so this is a nice little subtle that the rivet is made out of a different kind of metal than what's on the actual toe and gives us variety. That's what you really want is variety. Okay. And then it didn't cost me any more because I already had that material set up. Okay. So, and it's a, it's a warmer kind of uh, metal that's on there. Now the difference is, is this one has a bump on it in which that I use that, those cracks that we had used before. Okay. I didn't put the cracks on the, this metal because I didn't really want to have cracks on the metal. Um, and, I, and you're just barely going to be able to see them on the rivets. But what that meant was this rivet, um, this particular bitmap is on another mapping channel three. So it meant that as soon as I did my render, I got an error and I had to copy and put that mapping coordinate over here as well. And that way it only applies to those rivets. It doesn't really apply to this metal, but you had to have it on there so you didn't get an error message on that. 
And pretty much that's how I created the metal. Okay. So you're just using that stain, same staining process. Now, the other thing that I wanted to do, and you can kind of see it in, if you look in here, is you'll see there's kind of a rusted kind of stain that's going around these rivets in here. Okay. Kind of see it in there. That's my ambient occlusion trick. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm making a layer. Okay. Uh, for an ambient occlusion, let's turn that on. And I'm using the same ambient occlusion that I'd used on the leather. I'm using the same one. So it's not having to calculate a new ambient occlusion with new settings. I'm just using that same setting in here. I've got a color uh, correction node in here to give me color for it. Okay. And then I'm just piping that uh, ambient occlusion as the mask. And then I did the same thing before. It's very subtle at first. And so I just piped it back in and piped it back in again with multiply on. And then it finally ganged up or then it popped in. And you've got this nice kind of aging look around the edge of this. And the other thing is you'll see it in subtle areas too around the edge of the metal. Like if you get it right in here, you'll see it around the edge. So it's nice giving me this kind of um, patina kind of look around the edge of parts of the metal. Okay, and it didn't cost me anything in calculation time because we were already calculating that node to begin with. And that's pretty much how I did the metal. And then once, of course, you ha once you have this node, then you can apply it to any of the metals that are in there. And you might want to vary it where you're using this metal in certain things and then using this metal in certain things so that you have a variety of different looks for those metals. Now, the other thing that I did in here since my last uh, piece is you can see that I have gotten uh, a much lighter dust in here than I had on my original one. Let's look at that. So um, here is the original one, and I kind of went for a darkness on this, but after I started playing with it with the, the metal, I decided to go the opposite way. So I made and went for a, a lighter uh, ambient occlusion on there which got me this kind of a dusty kind of look like you spend walking around in, in um, a dusty, you know, area in Arizona or wherever, and you're building up dust in those areas, which is really nice. And of course it gives you that everywhere, everywhere that things occlude. So it was really nice because as soon as I put this metal in here, then it occluded that. And then it gave, it automatically gave me that around it. So it's reading the geometry. I didn't have to come in and tell it to put it there. It just automatically does it. As soon as I unhid this geometry, it read it and dropped it in there. Now, the other thing is I did the same thing on the rubber down here. So I added it to that as well. So let's look at the other things I changed because I, I changed the rubber up just a little bit and I changed up my uh, laces in here. So on the rubber, um, I did the same thing. So I did a composite, okay, and I came back on and I did the same thing on it with the ambient occlusion. I only needed two. I only need to gang it up once on itself here, but it's that same ambient occlusion dropped in here. I got myself a, um, you know, another color node here for what color I wanted that dust to be. Okay. You know, and you can do other things to break this up. You know, you could break this up as uh, noise. And so that dust was kind of breaking up and stuff. And then you can do that too. And I may do that in another video, but at first I just wanted to get the certain kind of look that I wanted. Uh, so I may do another video where I break some of the stuff up, but so this was the dust color it was going to put on there. Then it's got that ambient occlusion node that's coming through here. That's actually, uh, ganging it up and dropping it on top of the rubber, uh, node. Okay. Now on the shoelaces, what I did on that is when I did the first rendering of the shoelaces and let's look at that. You'll see that uh, this pattern is aligning with the lace. You'll see there's a checkerboard and it's lining going directly up with it. And what I decided is I wanted it to twist. Okay. I wanted it to twist. So what I did is uh, I went to the checker pattern and then I rotated it on the W. Okay. That's its length. Rotated it that way. And so it twisted it, so it seemed more like the uh, the lace was actually twisted. Now, I had created the lace tips too, and the only thing that I did add onto the lace tips since then is I went ahead and put those cracks that I had done as a bump on that.
to give it a subtle little, you can kind of see it in there if you look real close, a subtle, subtle breakup of this lace like you've actually, it's been used for a while. Because in the original one, it looked kind of brand new. See how that highlight runs straight across it there? Zoom in a little bit. Ran straight across it, and I wanted to break that up so it had a little bit more of a look of something that, you know, somebody had been bending and had been using for a while. So I, I altered the shader a little bit on the laces so that it gave a twist in it, which made it look a little bit more real, and also uh, breaking up this uh, little plastic tip that's on the shoelace. The other thing I did and is that I put a, I used the bump that I was using on the lace and I ran it through the displacement node with a really, really slight uh, setting. You can see it here. It's running through the bump, but I also ran it to the displacement. Now displacement changes the physical traits of it. And I, uh, so it actually alters the geometry, but I made it very slight 0.1. You have to be careful when you turn this on because it defaults to one and that's way too much and will blow it up. I would tell you that right off the bat, if you're going to use displacement right off the bat, turn it down to point one and then turn it up the amount you needed. I just needed a little bit. So it kind of swelled and it's breaking up the edge of it. So it doesn't seem like so much of a, just a trick of a tube and kind of broke that up. So that's the things that I changed on it. I kind of tweaked the laces a little bit. Uh, I tweak, tweaked the lace tip a little bit. That bump didn't cost me anything because it was the same bitmap I'd already loaded. Um, I added a little bit of dust onto the rubber. Uh, that didn't cost me anything because I'm using the same thing, same ambient occlusion. So I'm able to add a little bit more realism to these by breaking them up a little bit more. And it's not costing me anything uh, expensive in render time. Okay. So... Um, so for your metal, that's what I want uh, you to do for your metal is to go back onto it and uh, it's a pretty easy way to do the metal. Still gives it a nice customized kind of look. You don't have to do the ambient occlusion trick if you don't want to. Uh, that's just something special, but it adds these really nice little attributes to this to give it these little special things and you know I'm not having to unwrap it and paint all that stuff. It's just interactive. Okay, and it's the same thing. Once you have this shader made, you can use this shader, you know, save it into a library and use it over and over and over again. Okay. All right, so uh, you can see quite a bit of different uh, change. There's the initial leather, and then here's the final uh, one with our dust. Um, got our metal on there, got some uh, aging to the metal. Oh, and I, I guess I didn't go over the bump. The bump was pretty much the same thing as well, in which that um, I'm just taking that same uh, bitmap that I'm using for the staining, okay? And I just went directly into the bump with that, okay? So that's it's aligning with that. And let's turn it back on where you can see it. You can see it there with no bump on it, and then we'll turn the bump on. And you'll see that pops in and it's giving me little pock marks in there so that it's uh, seems like, you know, uh, that metal's been aged over time and it's starting to deteriorate some. OK. OK, so. Um, and that's pretty much it. OK, so, um, you know, it seems like a pretty complex node tree and to a certain degree it is, but once you, you know, understand how to deconstruct it and what's going on, it's not uh, too bad. Uh, it's really bad for people that don't use the slate editor. I see a lot of people use the, um, the compact material editor. You know, I think all those people are just in la la land. They're stuck in, you know, 1990s using this editor. This editor is old, I mean, old, ancient editor, and to create the complex nodes that uh, I have you guys creating uh, is a nightmare to try to create that node structure, um, you know, through this editor. You know, you really don't want that editor. Okay, the, the uh, Slate editor is so much more advanced and easy to, you know, plug in. And plus, you know, you need to get used to this node-based system because, Pretty much everything, Maya's node-based system, Unreal Engine's node-based system, all these editors, you know, Mari, 
anything that you reuse is going to be a node based system. So you need to get away from that compact editor if you're used to using that. Okay, so hopefully um, that gave you some more information and make it so that you can uh, pop your uh, boot together to get it uh, looking really nice. And uh, that's a pretty impressive look and it's not very hard to do and we didn't have to unwrap anything, okay? Which that's what we like is not having to unwrap things. So we wanna unwrap the things that we do. All I'm trying to do here is give you another tool set, you know, really, uh, you have three directions you can go. You can you can unwrap things at Paint Direct. That's good. And and for certain things, that's what I do. But a lot of people think that's the only way that you can do things. Uh, I'm showing you here a way to do things using titleable textures, but getting a customized look out of those by using a layer system and what I call staining. And then of course procedural textures is another one. And um, so. All of those are viable ways to use uh, your uh, surfacing to create the things you want. And all of them can be used in conjunction together at the same time. Okay. They're not, uh, you know, it had to be one way or the other. You can use them together. Okay. And I do that all the time. I mean, what you're trying to do is to get a nice customized look that looks believable and you want to do it as fast as possible. Uh, and so, you know, the more tools that you have, the more way that you can approach things from different directions, the better off you are. It's not about always unwrapping things and painting it in Photoshop or painting it in Mari or painting it in uh, Mudbox or ZBrush. There's lots of ways to do things like this. Now, uh, and so this is just one boot. You'd have the other boot. All you'd have to do is to uh, clone this make a, or make a copy of this and uh, mirror it. And then it would look just like this one. Okay. And we don't want it to look just like it. So then all you have to do is to go into your mapping coordinates, go into these gizmos and move them around. So you just go from one to the other. Make sure that you, when you uh, make a copy of it, you don't make an instance. When you make a copy, then your mapping coordinates can be different. And all you have to do is go in here and alter each one of these, you know, mapping coordinates, just move them a little bit, rotate them a little bit. And then the boot would have the same. Uh, look and feel of the boot, which they would because they're both being worn together, but they wouldn't be clones. They would look different. The patterns would be different. The alignments of things would be different. So they're kind of like, um, they're not identical twins. They're kind of like brothers and sisters of each other that uh, come from the same family, but they're not identical to each other. Okay. So hopefully that helped you out. Thank you very much.